Welcome to the Plain Faith Podcast, Episode 11. Realistically, I think it's about 900 and some feet where you're actually using it. But it's kind of a non-standard to going over tops of mountaintops, just 20 feet over tops of some of these houses that are there to be able to stay on like the altitude that you need to to get down in. And yeah, it's a really, really cool approach and never gets boring. The Plain Faith Podcast is a podcast about missionary aviation and the stories of missionary aviators who have taken seriously Jesus' command to go and make disciples of all nations and are using airplanes to be His witnesses at the ends of the earth. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Your host for today's show will be Jimmy Tidmore, who, in addition to hosting this podcast, is a pastor and a pilot residing with his family in what is known as the Rocket City, Huntsville, Alabama. He is very interested in promoting missionary aviation and helping prospective missionary pilots reach the mission field. And now, with these introductions out of the way, let's get started on another great episode of the Plain Faith Podcast. Welcome back to the Plain Faith Podcast. I'm excited to be back with a new episode after a long hiatus, and I'm looking forward to getting things going again with the podcast. Today's interview is certainly going to be a great way to kick that off. Our flight plan for today's show takes us back to Papua New Guinea, where we'll talk with Ryan Ferran, a missionary pilot serving there with his wife and his children. I really enjoyed talking to Ryan, and I know you will enjoy hearing from him as well. Ryan, I'm very happy that we're able to connect and do this interview today. Let me welcome you uh, to the Plain Faith um, Podcast, and I hope you're doing well today. Yeah, thanks for having me here. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. I, I know that I am interested in hearing about you and that our audience would be interested in hearing about you as well. So why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're from and where you grew up and so forth? Um, well, I'm from the States, obviously, but um, I would say, let's see, where would I start? Probably elementary age. We spent about four years over here in Papua New Guinea. I'm here in Papua New Guinea today. But uh, from first grade through about fifth grade, we were here in Papua New Guinea. And after that point, uh, my dad had some health issues. We took us back to the States, and I grew up most of my life in Michigan. And uh, yeah, so I think probably till about age of 25, I was in Michigan. So tell me about your, um, your family, your parents, your siblings, and so forth. Well, I've got two brothers. Um, one of them is a pastor. One of them is a missionary over in Portugal. And my parents were with uh, New Tribes Mission for 30 plus years and then just recently retired. They're living up in Missouri, and that's actually where I was born. So tell me about your your family. Your, I know that you are married and you have a few children. Tell me about them. Yeah, I've been married um, now for 15 years and got three kids. Got a daughter and two boys. My oldest is 13 and my youngest is nine. So they're all here living in Papua New Guinea. That's probably the first question. Is your family actually live there in PNG with you? And yes, they do. I, I know that has to make it better. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'd be. I, I know I wouldn't be here otherwise. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so how about uh, when did you become a follower of Jesus? Oh, man, that was five years old. So I grew up in a Christian home. Like I said, my parents were missionaries. Uh, they went into the mission when I was, I think, four years old. Or four years old is when they started, four or five. Um, but it was five when I, my mom was just going through the gospel and explaining what it was. And even at a young age, man, I realized that, man, I, there was no chance for me to to take my own sins away. So, yeah, I'm very blessed to have uh, the parents that I do have. Yeah, that is that is such a blessing. You are you're fortunate. I'm glad uh, to hear that you recognize that. So, next we'll move on, and and um, curious about what came first, your call to missions or your passion and interest in aviation. Yeah, I would probably say, man, ever since probably first grade, I've always been interested in aviation. 
I mean, I lived here in Papua New Guinea when I was in first grade, and I went on a couple of flights with our pilots here out to some bush locations for like Christmas vacation and things. And even from that age, I was like, oh man, I would love to be a pilot someday. I remember playing with like box fans as my twin engines and <laughs> with my brothers. Um, but I don't, as far as being called into missions, my, I would say my dad is always kind of really stressed, just like, man, everybody's called to be a part of sharing the gospel, whether it's at home or whether it's in missions. So honestly, I never felt like I had the call to come into missions. It was like, it was more of a choice. You know, I'm like, well, man, there's a huge need for missionaries. I want to be a pilot. There's always a huge need for missionary pilots. So man, let's do that as a career, just like anybody else would choose to be a doctor or a lawyer or plumber or whatever else. It was just like, yeah, this is what I want to do. Yeah, man, I, I appreciate uh, the way you explain that and and, uh, and share that. I think it's important for people to hear that because, yeah, sometimes there's some important big event or some sort of something uh, along the lines of a supernatural uh, intervention in your life. But, uh, at other times, you know, the, the call is, uh, it seems to me that, uh, it can be just more along natural lines, the way God's put you together. And the thing that, I mean, he's certainly behind the choices that we make and the desires we have. Right. And, uh, yeah. he, he can lead us in those ways uh, as well. So, um, I, I, I understand what you're saying and, and appreciate you, you sharing that. I'm sure that, uh, there, it seems that there's a lot of folks who listen to this or who are considering uh, missionary aviation. And uh, I suspect because, hey, I had to wrestle with a call to ministry myself. And um, sometimes you're looking for God to write something in the clouds, right? And uh, that's not that's not always the way it happens. He uh, gives us uh, desires uh, to do things and, and helps lead us sometimes through very uh, natural uh, means to to do the things that he would want us to do. Uh, so, yeah, and yeah I, thanks I for sharing when- when you do find something that you really, really enjoy doing and it fits in with a bigger purpose, like sharing the gospel, it, man, I really enjoy what I do here, but I do want to do, like, I think you just said something just about like, man, some people struggle with like going into missions and the call and, and I'm no different than anybody else. There's so many days that I'm just like, what am I doing this again for? Yeah. And I have to remind myself. And many times it's just my wife reminding me this is what we're here. Oh yeah. That's, that's what we're doing, you know, because there is, there is a pull to come back to the States and, you know, you see things online and stuff. You're like, man, man, I wish I could have that life. And you're like reminded, you know what? This life is super short and in light of eternity, we're just a blip. So why not use that blip for, uh, for eternity? Amen, brother. That's awesome. Uh, so, Ryan, do you have any advice for someone who's wrestling with a call to missions? Any help uh, you could give them as they're working through that in their mind? I guess for myself, because I've struggled with this a lot, you know, um, just gr- I've, I've grown up as a missionary kid my whole life. So I don't know, maybe just myself, but I always felt like I was missing out on life as a missionary kid. And, uh, I, I think for myself as once I did find something that I really, really enjoy doing, and like I said earlier, it was just that it has a purpose, an eternal purpose. Um, you get so much more fulfillment out of life when you're doing something with purpose. I, I find so many of my friends back in the States that are doing financially well, they're thinking, man, what what is the purpose of life? You know, I've made all this money and it still didn't make me happy. And I have this big house and I'm still feeling this empty void, but I guess living over here, it definitely has its downfalls of just not living in your own culture, but at the same time, I do feel like I have a purpose in life, and I feel like a big satisfaction in what I'm doing, Um, so yeah, I, I guess that's all I'd have to say is just that when you do find something that is has eternal purpose, then it's very, very rewarding and very fulfilling in life. All right. Well, thank you for that. So uh, let's move on now to talk about uh, your flight training. You said you became interested as a, probably a first grader in, in aviation, but um, how exactly did that come about? I kind of just put it on the back burner of my mind all the way up till probably, I would say 11th grade. 
in high school. And that's when I was like kind of thinking, you know, that's when everybody's asking you, what, what are you going to do when you get out of high school? And I was trying to really think, man, what do I actually want to do? And, um, so right out of high school, I went to a community college in Jackson, Michigan, where I lived. I was able to get a scholarship that paid for like a two year, um, at the community college and then some scholarships for flying and stuff. So I got my private pilot certificate when I was 19 and I flew for, I want to say like another like year after that. So it's like a total about a year and a half and I accumulated about 90 hours. But at that point, honestly, I was kind of bored with flying. It was like going and getting the hundred dollar hamburger or catching a sunset with a friend or, and I just, I wasn't flying enough to feel like I was progressing. I, you know, every time I'd go out, I'd maybe be forgetting little things or, and I think that was at the point where I was like, man, I, if this is what I'm going to do, then I need to go full in. But at this point, I'm not really sure if this is actually what I really want to do because it's actually kind of boring because there was no purpose behind it. I wasn't helping people. I wasn't, you know, doing actually what I really wanted to do in flying missions. So I actually quit flying for, I want to say like five years, I think. Mm -hmm. with with no even thinking that I was actually going to go back into aviation. At that point, I was like, all right, I'm done with this. It's too boring. I need to find something else. Um, I have a pretty short attention span, so I need to find something that's always continually changing and something new. Yeah, so my flight training was basic, basically the same as probably everybody else's. I just went to a community college and got my private certificate. I think I started in August, and I think in April was about the time I think I finished up my private certificate, something like that. And I also took like a commercial course at the time, did my written for my commercial, but then I didn't pursue it on any further than that. So I think I accumulated in about a year and a half, about 90 hours. I think it took me 75 hours to actually get my private certificate. And then I just barely flew after that um, for the next year and a half. So I just really wasn't progressing at all as time went on, which actually kind of made me nervous to go fly because, you know, it might be fly once a month. And that's just for myself, that just wasn't enough. So, um, you, it sounds like when you started flight training, you knew, you knew at that point that you wanted to go into mission aviation. Is that correct? Yeah, for sure. I, that's exactly what I wanted to do. But then as time went on, it was just like, man, how is God going to provide the money? Like a minimum of probably $40,000 to pay for this. Um, I wasn't going to be getting any money from my parents and the scholarship had run out and I was 19 years old, not making a lot of money. All my friends are out doing snowboarding trips and I'm spending all my money on flying. And so at that, I knew I wanted to go into missions and really at that point was kind of a turning point for my life was, do I actually want to go into missions as just a pilot or am I still willing to go into missions regardless if I'm flying or not? So that was the point that I went, decided, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and stop flying and pursue missions and see where that leads me and and to see if that if there's something else in missions that may be a better fit. Yeah, do you think I've heard people say um that you shouldn't pursue missions aviation unless you first just feel called will be happy on the mission field as a non-pilot. Do you kind of agree with that? It might depend on maybe what organization you go with or maybe how the structure is set up. Like here in Papua New Guinea, it's much, much different than flying in Indonesia or flying in the Philippines, even with the same organization. It's just a completely different setup. So where we're living here, we live on a big center of probably, I think, 300 other missionaries. And as a pilot, that's my only job as a pilot. I am a mechanic, but that I don't do any working on any planes very rarely. And it's usually just to help the mechanics, you know, with their inspections and stuff, but it's just very minor stuff. And I really, really enjoy that because I can focus on one thing and then be good at one thing. Whereas in like the Philippines, you know, they're living in just a city 
with just other Filipino people, and um, you don't have the the people from your own culture to. There is something about. I mean, it's fine living in the regular, the culture of the actual country, but to be able to connect on those different levels, there is so many other cultural things that you just don't think of with like different social classes and all these things. And I'm sure it'd be similar here in Papua New Guinea, but they also in the Philippines, like, you know, they're like the pilot, they're the supply buyer, they're the mechanic, they're the loader, they're, I mean, they do everything. And for myself, I could just see when I was looking at where do I want to go, I could see myself that that's going to burn me out if I do something like that. So finding a good fit for your personality and your gifts and abilities, I think is crucial when you are thinking missions in general. Yeah. Okay. And, and I think the intent behind uh, what people mean when they say that is that, you know, first of all, you're, you're called to missions, you're a missionary. And then, um, you know, secondarily, you're, you're a pilot. I, I think that's the intent behind. Yeah, uh, what... I could see. Yeah, I definitely could see that. Like that, that is really the reason why my wife and I are here is because we have a passion for tribal church planning coming first. And yes, I am a pilot, but um, I, our main passion is to see tribal church planning happen and to be a part of that in some way form or fashion, whether you're a plumber or a teacher or a pilot, it really doesn't matter. It's like, that's why the missionaries that are here, that's why they're, they're going to stay long-term. But for some other organizations that have pilots and they're trying to just build their hours and, oh, this would be a cool way to build, you know, an extra thousand hours. And then I'm going to go get my job at the airline. I don't think that mission aviation is a good fit for them, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate you. Uh, saying that, and I think that's think that's what people are are getting at when yeah. they when they say that sort of thing. So you got your private certificate, and uh, you flew. You, you said you know cl- get, getting close to one hundred hours, and kind of getting bored with just flying around, uh, looking at the same old stuff, and going to the same old places. And you said you took about a five year hiatus. Is that correct? Yeah, during that five years, uh, I went on to. Uh, Bible College up in Michigan at New Tribes Bible Institute. It was two years. It's where I met my wife. And at that time, she wanted to do like a tribal work overseas. And at that time, I was still thinking, you know, I hadn't stopped flying really at the very at the very beginning. And I was like, no, I still want to be a pilot, but let's get married and we'll figure it out later on what's the best fit for us. And kind of during that two years, that was when I quit flying. I think flying. My wife was actually my last flight that I actually took and then stopped for five years, went on through the rest of missionary training school. So it was about four years for that. And it was at the end of the training session, uh, the, the training in Missouri, we actually went down to Mexico for a month and a half for a language practicum. So we had learned all these methods on how to learn another language when If you're just like going into like a bush location, how would you learn a language? And at that time, we were still pursuing doing like a tribal work. At that time, we really weren't sure if that was a good fit for us. But at the time, that's what we were that we were working towards. And at that time, I wasn't even thinking aviation whatsoever. But through all of the courses on how to do Bible translation, how to learn a language, how to, you know, come up with an alphabet for a language that's never been written down. I was like, man, this is beyond boring. Like, it, I, I just can't stand this stuff. Like, I want to be a part of it and be able to support the people that are doing this. But I don't feel gifted in teaching. I don't enjoy preaching. Like, I don't like coming up with lesson plans. And like, those are all the main things for being a tribal church planner. So I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think this is going to be a good fit for me. I can see myself failing really quick. So... It was good that I saw that there and not waited till I got to the field because I've seen so many missionaries think that, oh man, this is the only way I can do it. And as if I'm a tribal church planner because they're the real missionaries, you know? And so, um, yeah, so it was at, at the end of that whole thing, we went down to Mexico for six weeks and on the way back, we were coming back up. And we're going to be driving back up to Missouri and we're like, hey, let's head over to uh, Arizona where 
the Ethnos 360 like main headquarters is for aviation. We've got some friends there. It's only an extra five hours drive out of the way. Let's just go say hi for a day and then be on our way. And it wasn't even like, it was really my wife's friend. It wasn't even like I was going to see my friends. But anyways, one of the guys there had take, took me flying one evening in a little super cub and doing all these little ridge crossings in Arizona and chasing cows and things like that. And I was like, man, this is what I need to be doing. Like it just totally relit the fire and came back to the house that evening. And my wife was like, you want to do this, don't you? And I was like, yes, I actually do. So she's like, all right, well, let's do it. So that pretty much just added on an extra like four years to ourselves getting to the field. But I'm glad that we took that extra detour to do this because I really love what I do. Yeah. So it's interesting. I mean, all that really is part of your, your call. I mean, whatever you want to call it, you know, God used you realizing, oh, this isn't what I want to do. It's pretty boring to me and I'm yeah. not feeling gifted in this area. And, uh, then, you know, flip side, just right on, right on the heels of that, you, you are exposed to the aviation side again and, and you realize, yeah, that's what I, what I need to do. And again, God, I just believe, uh, based on my own experience, uh, use it, uses those desires and, and things within us to, to kind of lead us in the direction he wants us to go. Uh, so that's cool. So then what was next? So, okay, I want, I've, I've not flown in a while. I want to do this again. Obviously there's a lot more training that's going to have to take place. So how did that play out? Where did you do that? And, um, just, yeah, give me some information there. Yeah. Um, so we were just finishing up with the missionary training center in Missouri at that time. And, the first thing that I needed to do at that time, an AMP mechanics license was required to be a pilot here um, with this mission. And so that was the first thing I needed to work on was just getting that and then start reflying whenever I could figure out how to find up, find the money to do so. So I was at looking up every college I could anywhere. I went down to Tulsa, Oklahoma to visit Spartan Aeronautics and checked out their school and it was like $40,000 I think at the time. And I was like, man, and even we walked through their school and I just really was not that thoroughly impressed with just, just the school itself. And so and it was only a four hour drive. So that's why we went there first, but I was mentioning it to someone. Um, and they're like, Oh, you should have checked out Tulsa tech while you were down there. It's another school. That's a state run school. And it is really cheap. And at the time it was $5,300 for the whole AMP course, 18 months, you get the same certificate that you would from any other school. And so I went, we went right back down the very next weekend, check that out and was just blown away with just like the facilities and just how nice it was because it's state run. They have a lot more money to work with and they have a lot more, you know, sponsors and people giving them airplanes to work on and engines that actually work. And so when you're rebuilding an engine, it, it actually works and you have to put it on a dyno. And if it doesn't work, well, then you failed. And mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, so we went on down to Tulsa, I think two weeks after we finished up with the missionary training center, we packed up and we moved down to Tulsa and we had a friend give us 500 bucks to, to help us on our move down. And that's pretty much all we had. We had enough money for the first month's worth of rent. We didn't have jobs and I hadn't been actually uh, accepted into the school. So we got down there, and then two weeks later, I was able to actually start with Tulsa Tech. I went in and talked to the counselors, and they were excited to, that I was 26 at the time, and most of the students there were just out of high school with really no, no path on what they actually wanted to do with their lives. So the counselors, they were really excited that, you know, I wanted to go into missions and I had a vision for my life and what it would look like. So they pretty much just threw money at me <laughs> to get yeah. what I needed to get done. They gave me, um, I had the Pell Grant that paid for everything. And then they had given me extra scholarships that paid for probably, it was like a thousand or $1,500 worth of tools and stuff. So it was cool to see how the Lord just started opening up doors that I yeah. wouldn't be able to open up, but yeah, so that was a, a year and a half. I did that, and then I started flying at the same time. We had I knew a couple people in the area that had airplanes. We tried going down those avenues, and and those doors just weren't opening. So I was like, man, I thought this is I thought this is the way God was going to work, and 
it seems that always uh, from my life, it's the way I think God's going to work, it's it's not that way, and it's some other way. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was the case for this as well. So um, I think we took out a loan for, I think we applied for like $11,000 loan so I could start flying, because that was basically like a $250 payment each month. And I was like, okay, this is something that we can barely afford. Let's go ahead and go with this so we can at least start flying. Mm-hmm. And because I at the time I just had no idea. I was like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to school also to do flying on top of the Tulsa Tech. I can do this with like some like freelance instructors and just start flying again and start building up, just flying on my own and then figure out how I'm going to get my commercial and my instrument and everything else. So, yeah, we did that. So we took like, I think like six grand from the bank and we're like, okay, we'll do this. And then we'll take the other five grand in a few months when we need it. But that was also 2008 when like the big financial crash oh, came. Yeah. So after we used the six grand and went back, even though we had already been pre-approved for the extra five grand, they're like, yeah, we're not mm-hmm. going to give that to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, oh, great. Now what am I going to do? But, you know, we got some money from people that we had never even met. Um, some family members gave us a loan and then, uh, the church that we were going to at the time, actually, it was a new church, and they had money set aside for missions, but they didn't have any missionaries. And they're like, "Hey, we wanna we wanna support you guys, and we wanna help you guys get to the field sooner," which is just unheard of that churches Absolutely. would support someone to do training. But they ended up paying like eight thousand dollars of my training. They helped me get my um, wow. my instrument rating as well as uh, my multi engine. So that was like a massive blessing. And to be honest, like looking back on how little money we made, because it was just my wife was working. um, She worked at uh, a restaurant serving and it was a really nice restaurant, which paid well with tips. But like that's all we were living on. So it's amazing that we hear that God provided the money to pay for. I think it was around thirty thousand dollars or so in about two years worth of flying. So it wasn't any money that I had come up with and. It wasn't savings or anything like that, that's for sure. But we came out of it debt-free, which was the best part awesome. of it all. Awesome. Okay. So we didn't really get into to your commercial stuff, which I imagine there's a, a story there as well. Yeah, so I think, like I said, I was doing my A&P um, mechanics license in Tulsa, Tulsa Tech, while my wife was working. So it was kind of a busy, interesting time. At that time, we had... Um, one child, she was about a year old at the time. And so my wife would work from, I think, 2.45 to 11 o'clock at night. And I would go to school from 6.45 in the morning and get home at 2.30. So we'd see each other for about 15 minutes of the day and pass off the kid. And so we did that for about two years. And in that two years, we had another kid. So it was a very, very busy two years while I was doing school and she was working. And then any free time I had on the weekends during the day, I'd go fly. So for myself at the time, like I said, I I had about 90 hours when I was picking back up with flying. And so I hired a couple of just uh, local instructors, local FBO, and went and got recurrent. And But I was still... I was still pretty nervous about flying solo because it had been so many years since I had looked at anything. So I bought an aviation GPS and I was like, dude, I'm golden now. Yeah. So I would just, I'd just go out and do like uh, long cross countries and I'd have my chart with me and I have my GPS and I just, I would try to follow along with the chart and then kind of just verify, okay, yep, I'm, I'm on course. And I just, did I I rebought all of the books that I had sold and then reread all of them cover to cover, just trying to like reteach myself everything that I had forgotten over the past five years. So it was a lot of just trial and error on my own port. I just didn't have the money and I didn't really believe even God that he would provide the money at the time. So I was trying to do everything as cheaply as possible. And even like when I was working on getting my commercial rating and I bought this book that it it described how to do all of the the maneuvers. So rather than actually taking an instructor out and just getting it done quickly and having them do it, I would just (laughs) go out on my own, read the book, and then I would do the maneuver and I was like, ah, it didn't work out right. So I'd reread it and then practice it again. And 
I did that for a lot of hours, and then I was like, all right, I just need to hire an instructor to get this done with and move on from this. At least you weren't taking the book up with you and reading it as you were uh, trying to do it. Oh, no, I'd take it with me. I'd, oh, you did I'd take it. it with you. <laughs> I'd take it with me. I'd, I'd read it, and I'd set it on the seat beside me. I'd practice the maneuver, and uh, it didn't work right. And I'd pull uh, back, what am I hel- doing wrong here? So, yeah. <laughs> that is hilarious. Uh, that's good. Okay, so you, um, so you get your instruments, you get your multi-engine, you uh, eventually finish up your commercial with just a, a local FBO flight instructor. Is that r- kind of right? Yeah, that's correct. So at that time, I had just finished up my 18 months getting my AMP. So I that was what I needed to do is the mission organization I wanted to go with, they required at least a, a year working in general aviation as a mechanic. Okay. And I, I thought it was kind of odd. If I'm going in as a pilot, they don't require me to have professional experience as a pilot, but they do as a mechanic. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of that was just rollover from how it was 20 years ago because mm-hmm. it was just different than it is now. We have completely different airplanes we have a completely different flight schedule just how we run things is so different than what it was 20 years ago but needless to say i worked as a mechanic um at a cessna service center so Mm -hmm. i worked on flight school planes that had just been haggard over the many years (laughs) yeah worked on 152s and 72s and duchesses and just planes like that that you'd find at a at a school so and then whenever um, like kind of our place that I work was the hub. So we had a lot of, um, flight planes at other schools all around the country and they would come back to us when they'd come out of lease and we would rebuild the engines. And then when we get a new engine, it would need to have a test flight. So I was able to get some test flying done for free there, which was pretty awesome. And just basically take the new engine, fly it over top of the field for about an hour or so. And, or if any planes came back from flight schools, they'd have me take it out and then just write a big squawk list of anything that wasn't working on it. So it was an opportunity. I think I probably got maybe 50 hours over the course of two years doing that. Um, and as I was still just flying as, as much as I could afford at the time. And I think after two I think after two years of working as a mechanic, um, I was at the time working on getting my CFI. And I, let's see, I'm trying to think how long that took. I hired an instructor. I learned my lesson on that one. I just hired the best instructor that I possibly could. I think he was close to 70 years old. And man, like, I still wish I could fly as smoothly, as perfectly as he could. Every maneuver. Yeah. He would just, he would nail it. It didn't matter what the wind condition was. He would just nail it. But um, yeah, I got my CFI um, after the second try. The first one, I I focused all my attention on like the flying and like the teaching of the lessons. And I I didn't even go over any of like how to be the instructor, which is the very first part of your CFI check ride is like, how do you teach? I didn't Mm -hmm. even bother with that. And they're like, yeah, you're not ready. I was like, oh man. (laughs) So my second one, which was about, I think, six months later, um, I had everything like books memorized when I went in there and was able to pass it. So I got an instructing job at a school um, that was right, actually right next to where I worked. They actually um, leased our airplanes that we worked on. Uh So it was really cool how God worked it out because... I was working 40 hours as a mechanic and I was like, I just, I don't have the time to go add another four to five hours of instructing in a day. And that's what the school would want from me. So I asked my boss, um, that I worked as a mechanic. I said, look, this is, he was a believer. And I said, this is what I want to do. He already knew I was going into missions. I was like, I really feel this is the next step. I need to start instructing. Can I split my time? where I go instruct from maybe like six o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock or seven till nine and then work from nine till five instead of like an eight to four or seven to four. And he was like, yeah, you know, I think you get as much done in a day or in four hours as most of these guys here do in a day. So yeah, why don't you do that? That's fine with me. And you can keep your full insurance plan, even though you won't be making the requirements and stuff. So that was a huge blessing to be able to have 
him allow me to basically go get a second job, still cut my hours, and still be able to keep my full insurance benefits. Yeah. So You got your CFI, I'm assuming, because you needed to build hours. Is that correct? Um, really, the reason I got my CFI is because I had a friend of mine at the AMP school who was an instructor, and he was saying, you know, if for no other reason, I recommend you getting your CFI and just instructing at least 100 hours because you'll learn so much mm-hmm. in that first 100 hours. And he's like, after the 100 hours, you can do what you want, but at least do that. And so that was really a lot of my motivation to getting it. And it was kind of like one of those far off goals that I never thought that I could ever achieve. You know, you see yeah. certain people that are like, oh, if I could only be that or if I could only be a CFI. I think it was one of those kind of unattainable goals that I really wanted to work towards. And once I did it, to be honest, I really did not enjoy instructing. I worked at a 141 school that had exclusively foreign students from like China, um, uh, Egypt and Sri Lanka. And, Mm -hmm. and so it was a lot of rich kids that really just didn't have the motivation that I had personally to get my, all my flying done, you know, they're like, they wanted to be spoon fed and, and just, there was a language barrier and just a cultural barrier. And I, I just didn't enjoy doing primary students. So I did that for like, I think like 200 hours, but it was over like, I think eight months is how long I did it for. Mm -hmm. And so the first six months, it was just primary students. And then after that, I just, I just couldn't keep up with working 12 to 13 hour days and getting paid the exact same as if I was getting just working my mechanics only. That's how it worked out as I was basically working 12 hour days, but I was getting paid exactly the same if I would just only work an eight hour day. So I was like, man, why am I doing this? I don't enjoy it at all. And, um, I went and did my technical evaluation at that time, um, with the organization I'm with. And, and I'm glad that I instructed before that because, I think it really, really freshened up my skills on pilotage, dead reckoning, using charts, and that was something that they had just hit on a lot. And um, they were just really impressed with just like, man, I have never had someone follow along the chart as well as you are on these, you know, um, uh, cross countries. And uh, that was a huge like, oh, man, I'm so glad that I actually did that. But after that, after they accepted me at that point, I was like, you know, I'm just not enjoying instructing at least this type of instructing. I think I would enjoy instructing maybe on the commercial level because I'm just honing in their skills rather than like, you know, teaching someone how to walk. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you, you instructed for about 200 hours and, uh, and, and then you kind of hung it up. Yeah. Um, I still keep, my CFI current every two years you have to do like a course right. to keep it current. And uh-huh. I just do that just because it only takes a few hours and I don't, if you, if it runs out, then it's just so much more work to get it right. back in. So, I mean, you basically have to take the, the check ride again. It's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Basically with like, I think a DME, I think is what they call it, but yeah. Right. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I don't ever, ever want to do that again. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to take the little online course. It just takes a couple of hours and pay my 50 bucks and do that for the rest of my life. Yeah. I, I, you know, I've heard so many people say how much they regretted letting that expire. Um, yeah. Cause they, you know, they thought, well, I'll never want to do this again. But then, you know, 10 years later they they do want to do it again, but they don't feel like the hassle. Yeah, Or, you know, if you have a kid that wants to learn how to yeah. fly, like you could just do that. And yeah, I have one kid that I wouldn't be surprised if he might want to do this someday. He's just the type of personality that, likes this kind of stuff. Yeah. So when you, when you got done with the 200 hours of instructing, I imagine you're getting close to 500 hours at that point, which is, yes. which is kind of a magic number, correct? Yeah. I had, I think 450 hours or something when I went and did my technical evaluation, which is, um, and you do this with any organization with missions, um, either with like MAF or jars or, uh, Ethnos 360 or any other ones is you basically mm-hmm. go and it was a week long evaluation. They were testing just my skills as a mechanic and um, as a pilot and there's even my own personal self. Like 
how, what's my personality like? Mm -hmm. How do I work well with people? And so, yeah, that was probably the most stressful week of my life because it was like a go or no go decision. Like, you know, if you go and they see things about you or your piloting skills or just your personality or whatever else that they're like, man, we don't think that's going to be a good fit, then that's pretty much it for you. So I've talked to people that have, yeah, they've spent their life dream working towards something just to, and, and specifically wanting to go with this particular organization and, and then to be told, yeah, I don't think you are a good fit for us. That's pretty mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. detrimental. And yeah, that, that could be pretty hurtful, but yeah. So thankfully they said yes. That, hey, so that was encouraging. I think that was some of the reasons why it took me so long to even decide I wanted to go into mission aviation is because of that. I was like, man, I don't want to put 10 years yeah. of my life towards something and then realize, oh no, maybe I'm not good enough to do that. Maybe I should have just gone and got a different type of flying job. Yeah. I hear you. So, um, after the technical evaluation, what, what was next from there? Did you still need to build more time and and how did it progress, uh, from there getting to the, getting to the mission field? So I did the technical evaluation, I think in February or January of, I don't even remember what year. And then it was in August of that same year is that I went to do their training, their nine months training. And so, during that time, they said, hey, here's a couple of things that we'd like you to work on. Your rudder control isn't that great. We want you to go back. Here's some little things that you could be do to help with that. And other than that, they said basically, hey, you can raise up a little bit of support um, to help pay for your, your nine months living here. And that was really hard to do, to be honest. Um, it's hard to get people to back you when you're like, no, no, I'm, I'm a missionary now, but I'm still doing the training. And so it's like mm-hmm. this awkward stage of, yeah, I'm in the mission now, but I'm not on the field, but you're still doing training. So why do I have to pay for your mission if you're not actually mm-hmm. overseas yet? So that was a very tight financial time. Um, we had to go on like state funding and stuff to help pay for things, which we're beyond grateful for that that's even available. Mm -hmm. Because that helped us get us through that training session. So we were there in Arizona for nine months. The first few months, um, we did some, um, like, projects and stuff. They put me on a project where it was a 206, and I'm trying to think of what it was called. MPV or something like that, 50. It was basically like this whole um, control unit that, took all of your steam gauges and put it into this nice, cool little digital display and connected everything, the GPS, the fuel burn, everything in it. And it was a super fun project. And then we did about 40 hours of flight training uh, into just some, like, I guess they'd be like Arizona bush locations. They were just little tiny dirt runways in the mountains. One of them was like a personally owned one that uh, I think was about 900 feet long. And couple other ones that were, I think, uh, I think they were right around 1,300 feet. And they were just wide enough for the 206 to land and have about three feet off of each of wheel. I mean, it was like you're landing on like a single track dirt uh-huh. road. They were super fun. I had so much fun doing that. So after that, we just spent another five months there. Um, I was working on a helicopter, getting it repainted and ready to go over to the Philippines. So... That was that was what my training was like before I got to the field. Okay, so after your training, you said you spent about five months, and then then were you on the field? No, what we did is it was nine months. So for the first okay. four months, it was basically mechanic, not training, but just, hey, let's see what your skills are and let's work with you. Mm-hmm. And really, it was kind of even a little bit of a vetting process of just saying like, they're getting a few months to work with you before they're like giving you the final, final stamp of, okay, you know, you've gotten the stamp from finishing up the missionary training. Okay. But you're not a missionary. Then you do your technical evaluation. Okay. Yep. You're good to go, but you're not a missionary. And then (laughs) it's Mm -hmm. like another nine months. And then it's like, okay, now this is the final, final stamp. Well, but not really. (laughs) So (laughs) yeah. So uh, we would like to see that change in the future because that that's very draining on, new pilots that are coming through of not knowing like 
have I made it yet? Like, when do I get the stamp of approval? So, yeah, we were there for nine months total, and then we came back to Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is where we had spent four years building relationships with our church, and that's when we started raising up our support more hardcore so that we could actually get to the field. And it still took a year and I think five months Mm -hmm. to get to the point where, okay, we're allowed to go now. So, and even at that time we weren't even fully funded, but I was like, you know what? God's provided in the past. We're at a safe amount until we can go and not have financial issues. Let's go ahead and go because I believe that God can raise up our support even more from here on out. So before we get to talking about the place where you're serving, uh, is there anything that you might want to share uh, with uh, someone who is in flight training to become a missionary pilot, maybe, or maybe at some other point in this uh, long uh, process that you've just described? Anything you would like to share with those, those types of folks? Maybe I wouldn't have wanted to hear this, but at the same time, it is with the truth. But it's like I said earlier, the average time for most pilots I think is 12 years from the time that they start their flight training to the time they actually get to the field, because there's so many things that you have to build along the way and experience. It's not like, you know, Hey, I've got my degree in such and such, and now I'm ready to go. There's a lot to learn. And it took me a lot longer just because I didn't know that this is actually what I wanted to do. I think if I would have just been really, really focused, you can definitely, definitely get it done in half that time for sure. I mean, we have one pilot here that I think he came when he was 20, he was 24 years old. He was like the youngest pilot we've ever had. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, knowing myself, like I remember when I was 26 and someone had sat me down and was like, Hey Ryan, you know, here's how you're coming across to people. I don't know if this is exactly who you want to portray yourself to be. And it was a huge wake-up call for me. So if I would have come when I was 26, I probably would have irritated a lot of people. <laughs> and I came when I was like, I don't even remember, like 32 or 33 years old. I think 33 years old. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad that I had that extra time to actually grow up because living, it's not just like you're a missionary pilot and it's all fun and games. Like There's a lot of other things just living on a base with other missionaries. It's, it's very difficult. It's like living with people you go to church with. And then you... Also, see them at the store, and they're your next-door neighbors, and you commute to work with them, and it's like, I think that's, so coming in a little bit older and learning how to just, working on your personal skills, I think is like, just as important as working on your piloting skills. All right, that's a great, great answer. So do tell us now about uh, where you're serving, what it's like, uh, how it's different from your home and and what you've been and what have been, you know, some of the things that you've found difficult to adjust to. Yeah. So we're here in Papua New Guinea and I live in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. So it's pretty much just kind of, it's near Garoka, just pretty much in the middle of it. We live at 4,000 feet and Garoka's right on 5,000. So we're surrounded by mountains, um, anywhere from maybe seven to 8,000 all the way up to maybe around 11,000 just in our vicinity, just outside my window. And, we're close to the equator, so the temperature is pretty much the same every single day of the year. It's about 64 degrees in the morning and about 80 to maybe 85 at the hottest during the afternoon every single day. Mm-hmm. So we have a dry season and a wet season, so half the year it's rainy all the time, really kind of starting, uh, I don't know, probably like 2, 30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, just about every single day of that six months it rains. And then the dry season, um, obviously it's dry, and and then maybe it, instead of raining like five or six days a week in the afternoon, it might rain like maybe two or three days of the week in the afternoon, maybe starting at like four. But it's very consistent and the same. It's super beautiful and green here. But um, I would say the thing I find the most difficult to adjust to, and and taking from someone who's grown up in missions literally my whole life from the age of Mm -hmm. like four or five is living with other missionaries. Like by far, hands down, that is the hardest thing to do is living on a base. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially if you're, you know, a a closed off person, like I'm not really one that's like, I'm not a huge extrovert. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of in the middle, you know? 
but just having to work with the same people that you live next to or you go to the same church and you go to the same store and you're living on a 35 acre fenced in area it can be very very wearing and i don't think that that's something that a lot of people that are wanting to go into missions necessarily think about now not every organization has this kind of base setup some of them might just live in a town or something but even that presents its own challenges just living in another culture um like um, it's hard to explain the culture here but i think people would be um more versed than like let's let's say if you were to go down to you know mexico and live down there like a lot of people know that that's just a little, a little more laid back you know they take the afternoons and have a siesta and um things maybe not run quite as efficiently as you would had hoped them to in the in the states and it's the same here you know the, i think the biggest thing is coming from america everything is let's how can we make this more efficient how can we make this the best possible such and such how can we help our customers get out the door happy and quickly where that's a completely foreign concept here <laughs> like they are not here to serve you. You are there to buy their product, and that is it. So just mm-hmm. living in a culture like that, you know, you go to Walmart, and you walk in, and you know exactly what aisle it is because everything is exactly the same, and you know they're going to have it. Here, I've spent, not exaggerating, six hours one day just trying to find, like, um, little hooks that I can make, like a coat, like a hat rack, and I didn't find what I was looking for. I went to every store in town. And nobody knew what I was talking about. So letting those little tiny frustrations wear on you, um, you'll be off the field in no time at all. If, if, if you're that type yeah. of person that it, those little things really bother you, then that's something that you need to figure out before you come to the field. Because, yeah, for sure, those things will just eat you alive. All right. So why don't you tell me a little bit more about uh, the organization that you're serving with? All right. Um, I work with Ethnos 360 and specifically the aviation division, obviously, but um, they are a little bit separate. But basically, the aviation is here to support tribal church planning. With Ethnos 360, their main focus is church planning in remote areas that have never had the gospel presented to them before, Mm -hmm. reaching the unreached people groups. So that's why aviation is needed. We have I'm trying to think of how many, I think we fly to maybe like 35 locations here in PNG where we have people or have had people at one time. And so basically they go in and they start learning a language that's never been learned before and never been written down before. So that could take anywhere from two years to eight years, sometimes more, but usually at least two to eight years. And they come up with an alphabet for them so they can start translating the Bible in their language. And then once they start teaching them, they go through the Bible chronologically, starting in Genesis and working all the way through Christ so that they're building on a good foundation. So it's not just like jumping in and showing them a Jesus film and just basically, they're very animistic here in Papua New Guinea and many of the places we work around the world. And animistic basically is, um, if you ever seen the movie Avatar, that pretty much sums up animism in in a nutshell. It's like, you know, everything has a spirit, the the trees, all, everything works together in nature. There, um, everything is spirit run. The spirits tells them what they can plant in their gardens, where they can go, when they can go out, these kind of things. So, um, if we just come in and share the gospel, starting with Christ using a translator or something, which is what they've done many years ago. They started realizing something something isn't clicking here. They're not getting the, the gospel. Like all they're doing is adding Jesus to the list of all their other gods, and they're like, "Oh, if it's working for the white man, then it will work for us. And if he's rich, then we'll get rich someday." Mm. So they really need to start from ground zero and build the foundation of, "Hey, this is this is God. This is who He is. Like this is how the world was created. You know, hey, you're a sinner." here's your, you know, position here, here, here's your, um, the state that you're in and and there's nothing you can do. So 
they build that until they get to Christ, and then they're like, and now here's the Savior. So it's it's they understand it as a big, basically like uh, just a huge long storyline. So it is cool how they do that. So, anyways, that's what we do as aviation is we support those missionaries so that they can live out in those tribes full time. So they typically are out there for at least three to six months at a time. So we fly them their food. We fly them, um, like if their kids come out to the boarding school out here, we fly them out. Um, if they do any projects, they do a lot of humanitarian stuff there as well, like making aid posts and teach, like making schools. So we fly in a lot of building supplies for them. And I would say probably... 95% of our work, at least, maybe even more than that, is just to support our own missionaries. And then we'll do maybe 5% or less of commercial work where we'll just do like a charter for someone, uh, for some local people, or fly their coffee out, mm -hmm. or different flights like that. But most of our flying is centered around missions. And that's why I specifically chose this organization is because that's where my heart was, is the tribal church planning aspect of it. Yeah, that that was my, actually my very next question. I mean, obviously there there are good, many good uh, organizations that you could uh, do this type of flying with, but I, I was definitely curious to hear what was it for you about Ethnos 360? Um, and so you say it was, it was just the emphasis on the tribal church planning that kind of made it, uh, drew you uh, to that, that particular organization. Yeah, and also even more so than just that of just tribal church planning, it was just their methodology and how they present the gospel to people. Mm -hmm. um, I've just seen, I've heard so many stories, you know, of like, yeah, we were driving through the streets, just throwing tracks out on the road. And and we had like 4,000 people get saved that day. And you're like, mm -hmm. how do you know they were saved? Like, do you, like, just because they read something, how do you know they're not just like taking what they read in this track and adding it to, their Buddha beliefs and because all these there's a lot of you know beliefs around the world and a lot of animistic stuff is that they believe that there's lots of gods mm -hmm. so yeah they could believe in Jesus that he's come and died and yeah he's a, he's definitely a god but to really understand that that's the only way that they're going to get their sins taken care of mm -hmm. wiped away clean like no I, I don't think that they understand that so that was why we wanted to come with this mission organization rather than just flying with another organization. Because yeah, like you said, there's a lot of them out there, but finding the one that fits um, yeah. with what you want to do is very important. Yeah. Okay. Um, so those are the reasons you settled on Ethnos 360. How, how did you end up in Papua New Guinea, what was that process like? How did you narrow down? Did you did you have a say in the matter? How does it work with them? Yeah, so they had a couple of different fields. They used to, I think, fly in I think maybe eight different countries, but now I think we're just down to three: the Philippines, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. And I was coming in as a fixed wing pilot only. I'm not a helicopter pilot yet, so. Um, my option were Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. And I spent some time here as a kid. So they kind of said, hey, we'd like you to go to New Guinea. Would you consider doing that? And I was like, yeah, that's actually where we're already wanting to go is Papua New Guinea. So that was really the deciding factor of why we came to Papua New Guinea. I really didn't want to go to Indonesia because there's not as much flying there. And just even just how the organizational structure there it's a lot different, and I wanted something where I could, I could know that I have a job in another twenty years because PNG isn't is is still going to need aviation in twenty years. That's for sure. So you you talked a little bit earlier about uh, the act, how uh, Ethnos three hundred and sixty trained you from the flying aspect, but how what did they do to help you prepare for the big changes that go from moving yourself and your family from uh, one country? Uh, to another um, and getting used to the cultural change and, and so forth. What, what did they do along those lines? Well, when we went through the missionary training center, just with Ethnos 360 rather than the aviation, that's where mm -hmm. we got prepared to live in another culture and how to learn a language and things like that. So that was really a lot before my aviation training. 
we took classes. Um, we took Bible classes, and we also took a lot of um, interpersonal skill classes on how to deal with conflict. And I would say, like I said, that would probably be the number one reason why people leave the mission field is either some type of medical thing or personal relationships. And I'd probably say personal relationships trumps everything. All right. Well, tell us about the planes that you fly and work with and the type of flying work that you normally do. Yeah, we fly the Quest Kodiak 100. It's very, very similar to um, a Cessna Caravan. Uh, the differences are it's about four feet shorter. The wingspan is probably eight feet shorter. And the Caravan is maybe about, I don't know, a foot wider or so. So it's a little bit more spacious. But um, the engine that we have in the Kodiak is a little bit more powerful than the Caravan. Our payload is really similar. So I know everything in kgs. If we took out all of our seats, we can put in right around 1,100 kgs, which I want to say, let me just figure that out, 2,400 pounds roughly. Mm -hmm. And it takes off typically, it's in less than 1,000 feet usually. Like most of our runways are here in Papua New Guinea, are right around 1,500 feet long is a very, very average length. Mm -hmm. And usually by about like the 60% mark, we're airborne. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's usually anywhere maybe like 800 feet or so is where we're getting off the ground. And then you can land if it's on a paved runway, if you're empty and low on fuel, you could probably land and stop with full reverse and heavy braking in probably 500 feet easily. Oh, wow. So I think the plane itself is full up. It's 7,250 7, pounds, so I think the plane is right around 5,000 pounds, uh, maybe a little bit less, 4,800 pounds or something by just by itself. So what's the, curiosity, curiosity sake, what is the um, shortest field that you can operate out of? The shortest field that we have here, let me just quickly look it up. Um, it's called Aziana. At least that's the shortest one that we fly out of. Mm-hmm. And Aziana is 340 meters long, but it's also on a full on hill. Uh, I think the steepest part of it's at a 19% slope, but mm. the way the slopes work is it's not like a percent. Like if it's, if you're thinking of like an angle or something, but it's a full on hill though. And it's very, very short when you see it, it doesn't look like a thousand feet cause it's a thousand feet to the very top and then including the parking bay and everything like that. So Realistically, I think it's about 900 and some feet where you're actually using it. Yeah. But it's a really, really fun approach. It's it's a, kind of a non-standard to going over tops of mountaintops, just 20 feet over tops of some of these houses that are there to be able to stay on like the altitude that you need to to get down in. And yeah, yeah. it's a really, really cool approach and never gets boring. Yeah. So besides uh, landing on short runways that are on a hill, uh, how does flying on the mission field compare to, to flying back here in the States? It's a lot more decision-making than, than I really kind of anticipated or really thought about. I would say that's probably the main thing coming here as opposed to flying in the States. When you fly in the States, especially if you're on like an IFR flight plan, ATC is there to assist you and tell you what to do basically like you have to make the decisions in the airplane but they're telling you when to go down they're telling you when to do this hey there's weather coming up i want you to deviate around this where here it's like you have to make your own decisions on what you're going to do and a lot of times you don't you don't have like well, only one of our three airplanes has a radar so you're making the decisions. Do I want to go left or right around this storm? If I go right now, I'm coming up against mountains. If I go left, I'm going out over the, you know, the plains. So I have more options to get other places. So I would say just making decisions and making them in a timely manner is very, very critical here in PNG. Yeah. I had a, a someone I interviewed a while back and I remember him saying, that he really learned what it means to be a PIC 
uh, when he when he was on the mission field that it, that those decisions, like you said, uh, really uh, become important. Yeah, and they could cost you your life if you know if you run your numbers wrong on how much weight you can take out of a specific bush location. That that could cost you your life if you do it wrong. Yeah, absolutely. So, what would you say is the most exciting part about being a missionary pilot? I would say the thing I like the most about it is just every day is different. Mm -hmm. Even if you're flying from point A to point B, and it could be the exact point B that you've flown to already twice this week, the weather is going to be different because we're close to the equator. We have um, microclimates. So rather than like a front in the United States where, hey, there's a front coming today and, you know, this big squall line is coming. It's like you could have a thunderstorm eight miles off your left wing and four miles off your right wing. And you still feel safe because you know that they're on tops of the mountains and they're not going anywhere. They're not coming down to the valley yet. Things typically don't move very fast here. And, and there's some predictability. It's some predictability, but not all. So I would say that's what I probably enjoy the most about is just the fact that every single day is different. So what about the most difficult part about being a missionary pilot? I'd probably say the first year of flying here by myself was the most difficult. And just learning the routes and for it to become comfortable for you again, because it's not necessarily that point. It's not like your flying skills. It's more your decision making and knowing all the options you have. Let's say if it's bad weather one day, what are my options to get into this valley safely? Um, And the first year, you're still kind of learning those. And you're also kind of, for myself, it was learning what my own comfort levels are. Like I had my instrument rating in the States, but I really didn't get any experience there. Mm -hmm. So coming here was the very first real experience. You know, I'm now thrown into not only sometimes heavy, bad IMC with heavy, heavy rain, determining if you want to go through stuff there's lightning up here. What am I going to do? Those were the decisions that I think I struggled with the most is learning where my comfort levels are. And is it worth going through this storm or should I add 10 minutes, go this other route, or should I just turn back and spend the night and come back tomorrow morning? I think that was the hardest thing for me for the first year to year and a half. And then once I've really kind of established my standards, my stress levels went down immensely Mm-hmm. And I started enjoying my job a hundred times more. Yeah. So you say, and you, you sort of developed your own, I mean, obviously your organization has some standard operating procedures and so forth, but you sort of developed your own personal standards where you're, you're not making a, uh, a decision on the fly. It either meets this criteria. Or it doesn't you're staying or you're going right. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, we obviously have standards, but, there it's like it's like flying IMC that because we don't have a lot of great weather forecasting and stuff you don't know how bad something is until you're really kind of in it sometimes and so really establishing what do i what are my own personal standards what do i feel comfortable just because i'm allowed to legally fly through this mm-hmm. do i want to and i think that's really what it was for myself determining is what do I feel comfortable flying through and what do I not feel comfortable flying through, whether I can do it legally or not? What do I feel safe doing and do I want to do it with passengers? Is one thing if I'm by myself or if I have passengers, I want to I want to get to my destination and I want them to really have enjoyed the flight, not get off the flight and go, I thought we were going to die today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's so. good. So um, do you have a... A, a favorite memory or a story uh, from your time there that, that you'd like to share with the audience? One of the memories that I had was, it wasn't even with our organization. It was with, a, I think, Pioneer Bible Translators and stuff. But it was cool to be able to be a part of their, they had just finished the New Testament, I think. And they had like a Bible dedication for the new the New Testament and to be able to be a part of that and to fly out everybody that was involved in it and stuff and just to see the people there on the ground and their excitement for it and stuff 
that was really, really cool and encouraging because sometimes you, you can, if you're just flying and just doing your daily job, sometimes you can easily forget, what am I doing this for? Because you're not hearing the stories always. And I would say even as a pilot, we do hear the stories more than anybody else because we're in direct contact with the, the tribal missionaries. But to be a part of those kind of things, it's always really cool. And as a reminder, just go like, oh, yeah, that's that's why we're doing this. Because, yeah, like any job, I mean, you can easily lose the focus on what you're doing. Or you can just, you know, see other people's Instagram feeds and be like, oh, man, it looks like they're having so much more fun than I'm having, you know, mm-hmm. back in the United States, back in home, back in, like, comfort land, I guess. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that was really cool and as just a good kind of – boost to be like oh no this is this is why we're doing this and i'm glad that i'm a part of it all right that's that's cool yeah if i'm correct some of those translations they take decades right multiple decades sometimes to, to yeah, complete they, they do they take a really long time and then after a lot of times they finish a the translation then they go back and do a revision because since they've d- written it, they're like, man, I've learned so much. And mm-hmm. now I can make this even even more clear and better to understand now yeah. that I'm more well-versed in this language. Okay. Well, what are some of the biggest struggles that you've dealt with personally since being on the mission field? I think probably one of the biggest struggles is just learning how to live in a close knit community. Like I've said that a couple times already, but just living in a close knit community with people, it's kind of like similar to maybe living with your family. You know, you become very comfortable with your family and you might say certain things or treat your family in a way that you'd never treat your friend. And it's mm-hmm. similar to that living on a base with people that you do become very close with. Sometimes you might say or do things that you wouldn't normally do because you you feel like you have the right to do so because you're that closely knit with the community. So I think navigating that and learning that, I would say, would probably be the biggest struggle we've had as a family. What about, have you had any spiritual struggles since you've been there? Um, I would say probably with spiritual struggles would be, I miss having a a church that we really enjoy going to. Um, Like we do have like a church um, service here, but I miss having the teaching from my own, you know, personal pastor that we really enjoy or things like that, that we just don't have here. And so we do a lot of podcasts with our kids and family just of our own pastors at home. So we're thankful that we have those kind of yeah. things, technology available to us. But I would say that would probably be the biggest thing that I miss about back in the States. And just like anywhere, it's it's easy to get caught up in your job and even just put God on the back burner, like spending personal time with him and wanting to grow in your own relationship with God. It, like it's no different if you're a missionary, like you're not some spiritual god. Like you're just mm-hmm. some Joe Schmo who's chosen this career path. I think that's where people get wrong a lot of times with missionaries is even the people that live out in the tribes. Man, I talk to, I fly everybody, and and the conversations we have on the way back, it's like I have them with their, they're saying, like, what am I doing out here? Like, I don't even want to be here. Like, I know that this is what God wants me to do, and, and I see the purpose behind it. But even those guys, man, they struggle with, sometimes being a missionary. So to think that, oh, I could never be a missionary. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, the missionaries are no more special than anybody else. Yeah. It sounds like when pastors get together, I don't want to do this. Why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> no yeah, question. Totally. Um, so how have your family and friends been helpful to you along the way? And even now that you're there? Uh, we, we've, thankful that we have a very supportive family. Both my side and my wife's side of the family are very supportive. They're both all believers. So that is really, really nice to have. I think it would be the added stress of having unbelieving parents and them not seeing your passion or also agreeing with your choices in life. Mm -hmm. I think Mm that would be really hard, but we're super thankful that we do have a family and even a lot of our friends that have a lot of my friends grew up here as missionary kids. So yeah, I think that's 
that's just encouraging to have. You don't have to explain yourself all the time. Yeah, for sure. Do you have any final suggestions or advice or encouragement for prospective missionary pilots? I would say I wish I had the advice is that if this is what God wants you to do, then he does provide the money. Mm. And it's hard because for myself, I've always struggled with, is this what God wants me to do with my life? And it really wasn't until I took that step that I started realizing, yes, this is. And for myself, money has always been a big struggle with like, how is God going to provide this? Or how, how is this ever going to happen? Because those are such huge numbers and I don't have that kind of money and I don't know the right people that have that kind of money. Mm -hmm. And I always think back at that old Testament story where, um, the priests were carrying the, um, uh, what's it called? I can't even think. The ark. The ark, yeah. And they had to step into the river before the river actually parted. And I feel like that has been the story of every single thing that we've done is mm -hmm. we had to make the very first step before we actually started seeing God work. Just yeah. because we prayed, oh, this is what I want to do, you know, I never once saw something miraculously happen until we actually stepped out in faith. Mm -hmm. And I think God does reward people that step out in faith. So that's what I would encourage people is, man, if this is what you really feel the Lord's leading you to do, then actually take the very first step and step out in faith and then see how God can provide or open up doors or meet people or whatever else it is. Because honestly, for us, I didn't see one thing happen until we started doing that. Yeah, All right. Well, is there a book that you'd like to recommend uh, to our listeners? It could be something about uh, missionary aviation or something that helped you grow in your Christian walk or even something that helped you along the way learning how to fly, and, and you can name more than one if you, if you like. To be honest, I don't have anything relating to aviation, but if people are wanting to go into missions, I and it, this isn't even like a Christian book, but I highly recommend How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah. Because that right there sums up probably 80% of most people's struggles on the mission field is just how to interact with people. So Interesting. I highly recommend people work on their personal skills um, because it's, 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 it's you won't understand it until you get to the field. And then it's like, oh, yeah, I can understand that now. So out of any book, I would say that's the book that I'd probably recommend. Awesome. So how can our audience be praying for you and your family? On a really personal level is just to be praying just as we're raising our kids. We want we want our kids to really turn out well and to be great adults that love the Lord and have a passion for missions, whether they're in missions or not. It doesn't really matter to me, but just have a passion for the Lord. And if anybody out there is raising their own kids, then they can also probably agree with this is that it's it can be a hard thing and so we want to do it really well so i think that's my wife and i's passion is just to really do it well i guess all right so last question and i'll go ahead and set it up but uh you have this awesome youtube channel um and i, and I want you to i want you to tell people about that because uh there, there are other missionary pilots making really good stuff too, but uh, something about yours has, has caught on with the uh, YouTube algorithm and uh, it's really taken off and, and the videos are great. And I think it is a good way for people who are thinking about missionary aviation to, to learn a, a little bit more about it and, and to see what it's all about. So definitely tell about your YouTube channel, how people can get to it and about other ways people can connect with you on social media or anywhere else to learn about you and, and maybe even become a financial supporter of your ministry. Yeah. So my YouTube channel is just called missionary Bush pilot. I kept it as simple as I could just so people could remember it. Yeah. Um, so you could just search for that. I'm also on Instagram, same thing. And also Facebook, I have a page, but most of my stuff on Facebook is just reiterating what I've already put on Instagram or on YouTube. But um, yeah, I've, had a passion for making videos for a lot of years. I used to do wedding photography and stuff, and I got a little bit bored with just kind of 
the mundaneness and the exact same thing every time. And I like creating new things. So um, I've been making videos, like I said, I think for like six years, but I've always wanted to do this. I wish I would have had some kind of content like this when I was first in my training to see what it was like. Cause I had no idea yeah. what to expect, what kind of decisions they're going to be making. So I wanted to make videos, but I also wanted to be able to do it in a way that I could, it could be easily manageable. Um, I like making motorcycle videos, but it takes so much time. And with flying videos, it's like, well, I'm already doing this. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not taking any more time out of my day to actually film it. It takes a little bit of time to edit it, but I really enjoy editing videos. So yeah, my whole thing through this is really, is to kind of, I started it to get back in the mode of instructing. I'd like to do instructing here eventually. So just kind of talking through my thought process. And I think it'd be really interesting to see a different aspect of aviation that I don't think a lot of people have ever seen or even thought about. There's a lot of people out there that are interested in aviation, but have never seen a, what a bush pilot does on a daily basis or what kind of places we go to or what kind of weather we have to deal with. So I think that would be interesting. So that's why I started making them. Yeah, well, they, they're outstanding. And, and I do imagine that uh, there are uh, kingdom uses for uh, your, your channel. It does, well, it does expose people to, to what it's all about. Um, and if somebody's considering it, uh, it, it, that may be what they need to, to, to kind of push them uh, to take that, that first step, as, you, as you've talked about. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't know, I can just see all sorts of stuff. If I, man, if I was in training to be a missionary pilot, I, I would be just eating your stuff up because, because well, it, yeah, it's, that's what it's I hope really people good. are doing is yeah. Getting some value out of it and getting a better, clearer picture on maybe what to expect if this is, Hey, this is what I want to do. Or yeah, that's not what I want to be doing. Yeah. I mean, I look at it and I'm like, I'm not landing there. You're crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> it'd be good to know that now. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, man. So to our listeners, if you haven't seen, uh, his, his channel, missionary bush pilot on YouTube, stop, right. Don't even listen to the rest of this. Just go on, uh, right now. Cause it, it is a outstanding, uh, channel. It's become one of my, my favorites on YouTube and I watch a lot of YouTube stuff. Well, great. Uh, so, well, all right, Ryan, I really, really appreciate it. Um, and I hope that, uh, we can stay in, in touch uh, with each other. Uh, as as things go on for you and things go on uh, for me. And if there's ever anything that I uh, can do for you uh, to repay the favor of you coming on, on the show, I would love to do it. Um, and again, I really do hope we could stay in touch. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me on. I really do appreciate it. And uh, I've enjoyed our chat. All right, man. God bless. Uh, God bless your family as well. And, and I, I want you to take care. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, that's it for this episode. We thank you once again for listening. You can learn more about the podcast and subscribe to it by visiting plainfaith.com. That's P-L-A-N-E faith.com. You will also find links there to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you are interested in becoming a patron of the show, you can do that as well by visiting patreon.com forward slash plain faith. And of course, Jimmy would love to hear from you personally. So feel free to email him at jimmy at plainfaith.com or by using the contact form on our website. Until next time, remember that God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The intro and outro music for the Plain Faith podcast is a song called Chipper by Kevin McLeod. You can find his work at incompetech.com.